estudiantes, vamos a aprender. Today, we are going into internal symmetry. Up until now, we've been working mostly on external symmetry. But of course, that external symmetry is just that outward manifestation of the symmetry inside the crystal. In the textbook, this is pages 143 to 168, and the meat's probably earlier in that amount of pages. Um, we've been learning about things like crystal forms. We've learned the 32 crystal classes, and, and all of those outward expressions really are just a reflection of the internal symmetry. So to start, we're kind of doing just, a, Roman numeral one is going to be like a big recall. And there's things we're going to recall. We're going to recall the 10 crystal classes that you have to memorize of the 32. There's all those crystal forms. There's concepts like the motif and the unit cell. What's the definition of a motif? It's like our first or second le lecture. A motif is a unit that's repeated. A unit cell is the smallest unit of a structure that can be infinitely repeated to generate the full structure. Uh, there's another word that mattered a lot from earlier on, and that is the lattice, orderly repeat of the unit cell. So let's go ahead and just um, underneath this recall, let's draw uh, unit cell. You know, I'm moving away from the cube. I'm going to make things a little fancier. Let's do, maybe this is a triclinic. It just depends right on the angles, but let's draw this in. Let's see, here we go. This comes down at an angle. We come up in. Okay, that's not too bad. Oh, it is a little bad. Dot, dot, dot. Done. All right, you're doing this too, I hope. All right, so there is one unit cell. And in general, in minerals, the unit cell going from like in one of the dimensions, either the X, or sorry, the A, the B, or the C, is around 10 angstroms. I think that's 10 to the minus 10 meters. It's a very small thing. And we could repeat this unit cell. We could draw, oh gosh, that line's supposed to be straight. Drawing on a tablet is like an interesting lesson. I have really good penmanship. Have I bragged about that? I have really good penmanship when it is not on a tablet. And you are seeing what happens. These are supposed to be the exact same shape. I want to almost pause this video and start over again. But hopefully what you've done is you've drawn these two exactly the same shape, showing a translation of the unit cell. And within like one centimeter of a normal crystal, we're going to get something on the order of 100 million translations within just one centimeter of a crystal. I'm saying this just so you get a sense of the scale of the unit cell. We can actually m image these now with transmission electron microscopes. That's how amazing our technology is. So about 100 million translations in one centimeter's worth of a crystal. So that's our background, warming ourselves up. Let's move on to the actual main topic today. And that's introducing to you the idea of a space group. The space group is the possible ways internally to combine motifs into a three-dimensional array. I'm going to go ahead and put that definition down here. But we have, we have a whole lot of different possibilities. There ends up being 230 of them. Possible ways to arrange or combine uh, we'll say motifs into a three-dimensional array. And what we're doing is we're combining these things using our different symmetry elements. So let's say uh, our combinations that we care about, so far these include mirror planes, roto inversions, and uh, rotations. That's what we used on the external symmetry of a crystal. But Internally, we have two other things we need to consider. So we're going to put a little A here. And in, so in addition to these combinations, we're also going to add two new symmetry elements. Well, one we've already talked about, and that is a glide. And the other is called a screw. These are things that can be going on inside of the crystal as a symmetry element. A glide, if you remember a glide, it's a mirror 
There's our comma. And what we do is we reflect and we translate. We reflect and we translate, all right, to get a glide. So this is a translation plus a reflection. And a screw is kind of similar to it. It's a translation plus a rotation. Plus a rotation. Now we know how the threads on a screw look. And so the name screw for this symmetry is actually a really good one, in my opinion. Uh, I shouldn't cover the words, should I? Uh, but then I, I'll cover my drawing, because it's just my drawing. So here's what we got with the screw. We have our original motif right right here and what we're going to do is we're going to translate up and we're going to rotate around giving ourselves this progressive screw action around the exterior of this cylinder i want to show it to you in practice let's just kind of go an example what's a mineral that internally has a screw inside of it well quartz is one of them we've probably shown you enough pictures of quartz but here's a beautiful image of quartz and if we were to look at the lattice of quartz and I'm not expecting you to write this down okay this is just now some visual instruction the lattice of quartz has a screw inside of it and okay so let's see we have these different colored balls uh, the chemical formula for quartz is SiO2 it is in the hexagonal system in the rhombohedral division. Sometimes that rhombohedral division is called the trigonal division. And so what we actually have here is silica tetrahedron, right? There's a shape you've heard before. And the silica tetrahedron has one silica that's bonded to one, two, three, four oxygens. So if we look here, where's the silica tetrahedron? Well, this, the beige, that is our silica. And these reds, are our oxygens. Now where is the screw however? Well the screw can be found with the silicons. You go here, down, down, right? And you kind of can see that you're progressing down and around by connecting the silicons. Let me show you just one better example from a website called the Quartz Page. Oh boy, where did I... I misplaced the image on my desktop. How can I find it for you without ruining my video? I can't. Guess what I was going to show you? I was going to show you a screwing pattern within quartz. Perhaps we've already established that that is what exists. So that was our example. With the addition of screws and glides, we actually have something called, we have 230 space groups. And if you were a very high-end mineralogist, higher-end than me, I've never learned all 230, and I'm certainly not going to ask that you learn 230. But I do want you to focus, we're going to focus on three general kind of lattice organizations, and those three are going to take us to 14. But really, just let's not get overwhelmed. Let's just say we're going to focus on three. To focus on this three, we need to draw three sets of axes. Here's what I want you to do. Nice and clean, before we get too crazy, we're going to draw axes. We're going to draw, try to do this slowly and carefully. Here's a C axis. There's our B axis. And then the A axis comes out of the page towards you. All right, A, C, and B. And now I want you to do it two more times. We're going to draw three different types of space groups. They're lattices. And to do that, we're gonna, we need to introduce the concept of nodes. Nodes are basically um, symmetry points within a lattice. And up until now, we've drawn our lattices with nodes at corners. And that is one of the types of space groups. It's called a primitive lattice. And this is the easiest one to draw. We're going to start first. I'm going to put in some dots, okay, and we're going to connect those dots. So one dot, I'll make this kind of a rectangular orthorhombic shape. So we can draw a new line here. All right, we're going to make this in 3D. So there's just the base of the 3D block. 
and we got to go up and put in our additional nodes. Hopefully you see what shape I'm going for here. There's a node. Now we're going to have another node right here. We can connect those up. Now we have a fully drawn three-dimensional shape. Once you've got that, I better em let's emphasize these nodes a little bit more. We're going to say here, we're going to say our nodes only at corners. All right, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them. That's simple. Now, and it's actually primitive. The next type is a little more complicated than that. We're going to draw this exact same shape, and then we're going to add an additional node because this one is called body centered. But let's start by drawing that same shape. Putting in our nodes, basically our primitive nodes. No point in rushing, right? Because rushing is just going to make your drawing look worse. Here, almost had it drawn. Ooh, mine looks worse than my first one. I hope yours looks better than your first one. And what we've drawn in right now is that there are the primitive nodes. They're still there. But in this example, we're calling a bodied centered. And to have a bodied centered lattice, we need to put a dot right in the middle of this shape. You can kind of like draw in some lines to kind of project where something should be. And right here, smack dab, in the middle, there's an additional node. And this is called the body centered lattice. And then lastly, there's one that's called face centered. And you can probably guess where the nodes are additionally going to go, but we need to draw our shape first. So let's go ahead and put in our primitive, and then we will complicate it from there. That is just embarrassing. I don't have time to mess that up so bad. So on our axis, we have one, two. Thanks for bearing with me. This is, again, what your shape should initially look like. The primitive lattice, but we're going to make this one face-centered. So we're going to add node points. Here's a node on the front face. Here's one on the right face, and there'd be one here on the left, on the back, on the top, and on the bottom. So we can actually add nodes on all the faces. One of the weird things about face-centered is you don't, sometimes lattices are face-centered, and they have like, uh, let's say this, all six faces have them. But you can also have face-centered ones that only are on the C-axis faces. Only on... Oh, we could do that with our Miller indices, couldn't we? What would be the face symbol for uh, the Miller indice for a face that intersects a C axis? Well, it would be 0, 0, bar 1. That's probably not the one you would have said first. You would have said 0, 0, 1 first. Okay, so those are our three possibilities for Brave. Oh, I didn't introduce that word to you yet, did I? Well, these are actually called Brave lattices. That's where I was headed. So we're going to go big C. These are called. Brave lattices. And you can take those three and put one in each of the crystal systems, and you end up getting 14 possible combinations in nature. 14 different combinations possible. So, what we do here is to get the Brave lattices, we would say each system, each crystal system may have primitive, body-centered, or face-centered lattices. The textbook has a really good figure that summarizes all the potential Brave lattices. 
I'm just going to snag it in right here, but I totally recommend you go to the textbook and you look this up. So what I'd want to emphasize here for you is that, okay, let's just look at the triclinic system. The triclinic system can only have a primitive crystal lattice. And so what you do is you put the nodes on the corners and you make sure that you've established that A does not equal B does not equal C and that alpha does not equal gamma does not equal beta. Now monoclinic can have a body centered or a primitive lattice, making sure that you're drawing them with the appropriate crystal um, lattice lengths on the A, B, and C axis. All right, orthorhombic can be primitive, face centered on the C axis, face centered on all the axes, or body centered. Drawing them as A does not equal B does not equal C, but all the angles are 90. All right, tetragonal, same deal, primitive or body centered. Hexagonal, what is this one? Primitive or C, face centered. Rhombohedral is only primitive. Isometric, well, we've got a body centered, we've got a face centered, and we've got a primitive. So those are our different possibilities. And then the last thing, I know this lecture has gotten a, a tad bit long, but I want to drive home one point as our Roman numeral three. It's not an unimportant point, and that is how do we visualize, right? So we're, we're getting towards visualizing crystal structure. And when I say that, what I mean is, where do we actually place the atoms? Atom placement in a lattice. It is not only at the nodes. Now you definitely can put atoms at the nodes, at the primitive corners, at the body centers, but we're going to put a star here. There's our star, and the star says not only at nodes, but some are at nodes. We're going to finish with a couple examples, two examples. Here is the lattice for diamond. All right, so here's our example. Our example is diamond. The chemical formula for diamond is carbon. So every one of these balls is a carbon atom. And if you look at where the carbons are, we can see they're here at the corners. All right, so we'd say, okay, maybe it's primitive, but then look at here, there's a carbon. Here's a carbon in the middle of the face. Here's a carbon at the middle of the face. So maybe actually this is face-centered. There are additional carbons hanging out right here, 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 here. Those are not on the nodes, but they are certainly part of atoms within the structure and within the lattice. All right, I'm driving home this point. They're not only at the nodes. One last example here is fluorite. The chemical formula for fluorite is CaF2, fluorite, CaF2. It forms isometric crystal system, 4 over M bar 3, 2 over M. But what about its lattice type? Well, the calciums occur on the corners, and the calciums also occur, here look at that, on each of the faces. So this ends up being an isometric face-centered lattice. And the fluorines, they don't occur on any of the nodes. They're interstitial to the nodes, right? So here they are shown in green. Okay, that was it for today. Thanks for working with me. Next is going to be, next lecture will be a, an entire example on internal symmetry that we work through bit by bit.